Uh, the real the real issue here that's I guess most interesting is that we're we're seeing a number of a number of people whose reputations and knowledge base and skills uh, are significant uh, who have chosen to uh, uh, to join the uh, the the um, people who feel that the growth and in research into into uh, the uh, generative AI, the large language model A AI stuff, really needs to be slowed and controlled and done by uh, quote experts end of quote. Whereas uh, some other people, and I'm in that category, sort of think that that's uh, that was a, would have been an interesting uh, choice uh, uh, quite a while ago. But right now, the genie is out of the bottle, and it's unlikely that we can put it back in. And that, in fact, the the large language model AI is going to become a standard uh, tool of everybody, particularly um, people trying to change the world, um, perhaps last week or the week before. And so that we really sort of need to figure out what and how we feel about it. It's quite clear that uh, the, length, the, the they're not a perfect mechanism at this point. It works fairly well, but not not great. And yet, uh, it's good enough so that uh, uh, many things look uh, look very very good. Um, and it can be used to uh, to accomplish things. And it, it is self improving in the sense that as experience grows and it gets incorporated into the 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 uh, data that's used to generate the. Uh, the uh, processes, the um, the new this newly discovered things get incorporated in amongst the old things, and things get better and better. Um, so I, I think that's that's going to be a big problem, and I'm curious as to what's going on. There seems to be a, a strong bias. Uh, throughout the uh, uh, the um, people who are uh, experimenting with this, that this is dangerous technology and that you need to wear uh, protective clothing and um, so forth when you uh, when you work on uh, on the the, uh, the large language model AIs. Um, I'm not certain I believe that, but no. certainly many people many people behave that way. Everybody's getting in the act. Yeah. And lots of specialized <clears throat> systems are being put together. Uh, there are people building legal systems. There are people building uh, dating systems. And uh, almost everything, everything that you can do uh, in terms of interacting with humans is uh, seems to have a somebody working on a variant of uh, of the uh, chat gpt uh which uh, is targeted to that particular uh space um going to be a mob scene do you think so maybe cuz everybody and their brothers into it whether they know what they're doing or not well okay but what does it mean to know what you're doing in this <laughs> well, correct <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So, so I read Hinton's uh, interview or uh, pieces of it. And one thing that struck me was he's assuming um, linear, he's extrapolating the, the rapid rate of improvement that we've seen over the last couple of years. And we've seen this before. We saw this with uh, self driving cars, they improved dramatically, very quickly. And then all of a sudden plateaued. And I'm wondering if that's something that's likely to happen here or not. Well, I don't know. Um, I mean, there, there, there are lots of examples um, where uh, the Moore's log like, uh, like things have, uh, have, um, have uh, just continued on for a long time. I mean, it took, it took, uh, uh, almost 50 years before Moore's, Moore's Law was came uh, uh, obsolete. 
True. And it wasn't repealed, it was just uh, modified. True, but there are plenty of things that, that have saturated and slowed down the performance dramatically. And so uh, the question is, which, which one is these? Um, a lot of it um, is uh, data limited. They accelerate very fast until they've consumed all the data. And then they can't improve more without a lot more data. And so that seems to be a limiting factor in these learning systems, at least. Um, yeah. But do we do we know that the systems that people are using, uh, like GPT-4, uh, are really learning systems or are they something else? Because at least my understanding of how it works is basically it's a, a, it, it's really a, a a short short term uh, semiotic semiotic predictor. It looks, it has a language it's uh, it, it it's using, and it uh, predicts the next thing, in some uh, uh, some sense by some mechanism, and that gives it another piece of information, and it builds on that. So it's a, basically a uh, a projection into uh, some sort of space of probabilistic space of uh of futures and one of them is selected by some mechanism and that mechanism is the, is considered the output yeah there was an interesting example uh, in the new york times where they showed how the response evolved over the two seconds you have to wait to get it from mm -hmm. just random characters to utter gibberish to semi-sensible to the final result um, but again it's it's based, uh, it improves by getting more data to improve its statistics. And if, when it runs out of data, doesn't that limit its improvement? Um, I don't know. That was my question. So I was hoping Is there somebody, any, anybody out there who would like to comment on that? I might know. I don't know. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> hello. Yeah, I'm just setting up. Uh, I think this question was also brought up in the video that uh, uh, Danny shared before mm -hmm. this uh, colloquium. Mm -hmm. So uh, the point is that uh, on, to on point of data is uh, that there is a chance that when it runs out of data due to the complexity of the system, it can generate its own data. Yes. So, um, and since also there are new features appearing, uh, which also I found, uh, I think, mentioned in the video, if I remember correctly, that it start to transcribe uh, information from audio uh, means, so mediums like uh, radio or maybe some podcasts, uh, YouTube is a big mm -hmm. source. So this one as well. And uh, yeah, so it's also, Worf, I think, uh, definitely studying how this process will go, but again, due to the black box um, going on uh, in the system, it can be a little complicated or quite complicated, not really to do mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I think that's that's exactly true. First of all, we, we don't know, there might be much larger collections of data that may be available either immediately or shortly. There's, I mean, imagine translating all of the YouTube uh, videos, just, you know, converting them into uh, text and, and feeding it in. You know, there may be a, a lot of sources like that. The second thing is, we don't really know how much there already is in there because we're, we're just beginning to discover, to mine the actionable insights that are available in the databases that they currently have. And a related point to that is that as the models get bigger, you know, as they throw more computing power at it, you get a more fine grained uh, detail of uh, what they can do uh, and what, you know, what they can express. And so we, we just, you know, we may be able to increase the computing power and get a lot more out of these systems than, than we're uh, just, you know, we may just be scratching the surface today. You know, I was just reading a bunch of stuff today. It's, some of it's pretty disturbing about, you know, what kinds of things you can persuade these systems to do. So they're putting out tools that have the uh, possibility 
that they can do some very bad things and people can use them for some very bad things. And we just don't know yet, you know, that, that that's in there and, and that it's capable in ways that they can, you know, customize persuasion and change the way advertising is done and, you know, pollute our public square. You know, these are all issues that I think are very real, but uh, I don't know if it's where, if it, it's going to be asymptotic at some point, but it's not at all clear that we're anywhere near that. Do you think, do you think that the, uh output of the uh, various uh, systems that people build will get incorporated in the inputs and used, be used to build the models? Um, well, I, yeah, I don't know where I read that, but I just saw something that, that basically, since it learns from language, these systems can generate language, and then you can feed that back in, and that does, in fact, improve their performance. Now, that's got to be asymptotic at some point, but... Uh, it, it's just another technique for accelerating, you know, what what kind of value you can get out of these enormous collections of sort of humanity's knowledge. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that 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 the structure that we have, which is basically a, a sort of forward predictive, uh, uh, probabilistic one, where we select out a path through some very complicated probabilistic hyperspace? Uh, by some technique, and that that remains to be uh, clarified, of course. But is that is that going to be is that a is that a hint as to how consciousness works? If you're asking me, I haven't got a clue. The whole thing, you know, like you guys, most of you guys, I've been looking at this stuff for fifty years, and I never, I can't believe this has happened. Uh, I'm actually kind of, in a way, I'm 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 uh, grateful that I live to see this. You know, this is a real game changer. Uh, and uh, I don't think we can minimize that, not to say it's not gonna have limitations. You know, it's not the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, super intelligent uh, thing that's gonna take over the earth. But, um, you know, I, I have no idea. The idea that predicting the next word can lead, or the next token can lead to the stuff that we're seeing is just, to me, it's inexplicable. You know, it's like aliens landed and they're playing a joke on us and just expressing themselves through this mechanism. So I, I, I have no idea where this goes, you know. <laughs> I have and to second if, that. That's exactly my feeling. Yeah, you know, if if people like us think that, you know, we're we're just not gonna know the answer for, for a while. And you know, I, I you know, it's it's hard enough to describe to people what's going on. And you know, I, I'm getting asked, I'm sure you got you folks are too, you know. Everybody from uh, my mother, who's still around, amazingly enough, to to you know people writing to me, just saying, "What's this going to mean?" And uh, I, I I don't know. I'm having trouble figuring it out. Another interesting feature that you know, while well, I was just working on a piece of software where I have to have a you know run a bunch of test cases and then test cases fail, and I try to improve the software so it passes passes more test cases. It seems to me that you know the ability for uh, systems like this to run software really kind of is remarkable because not only can they potentially improve the underlying software, but they could potentially generate more test cases, which could then, you know, improve the software more, which, you know, so the ability of generating new test cases. And also if you look at simulation, you know, like at some point you're going to be able to simulate, you know, molecules and chemistry and all sorts of things and sort of, you know, aggregate systems. Now there may be a scalability issue, uh, but I think, you know, the, the ability of the systems to generate more new test cases for themselves uh, it's pretty clear that that could happen in software, and I expect it could happen in other domains as well. Yeah. I, ju I just attended the Stanford Security Day, and one of the talks was using uh, the co-pilot for writing, helping you write code. And the problem was that the code that co-pilot recommended was far less secure than the code that people who didn't use co-pilot ended up writing. Um, and in fact, one example was Copilot recommended this block of code. And in the comments, it said, for educational purposes only, do not use. Um, and so we, we still have some risks there in terms of using these things as, uh, as uh, uh, code writers for us. Although I'm very bad at writing tests, and I'd love to get somebody to help me write tests. So that might uh, be safer than having it generate the code. 
Well, it's a good thing that human programmers never like mindlessly cut and paste from Stack Overflow or from other pieces of code. Uh, by the way, I have an example from Stack Overflow that says you should use the same password and it's highly upvoted. It's got 170 upvotes. It says you should use the same password at google.com and google.evil.com. So there's... <laughs> okay. I think... Yeah, uh, I just I just wanted to respond to what you said about how the copilot recommended some code that was less secure than what they ended up going with. But if you if you copilot is just another stream of like information like it's something to help you. It's not supposed to it, it it wouldn't necessarily always like as a human would not always write the perfect piece of code that would solve the problem the best way possible. So it's kind of like you have to look at it with multiple, multiple people, multiple co-pilots to take a look at um, the same block of code and then evaluate it and say this one is more secure than that one and then make a decision as you know, as the same way we write code these days. Whenever I write code, I need at least two or, other, two, two or three other people at the company to review it and kind of give me back some feedback before we can push it to production. So there are levels of um, kind of between when when we get someone to code and when you actually deploy it. Right. Well, you know, they they um they they uh they surveyed the, the programmers and the programmers who used copilot thought they were generating more secure code than the programmers who were not using copilot, um, which is is a danger too. Uh, but yes, you know, code reviews are, are critical. If anybody wants to review my code, please do. But one rule is you're not allowed to laugh at it. Um, anyway, I thought that was an interesting point, and and the the conclusion was that Copilot lacked context. So, in particular, in file access, it it couldn't understand when the context said that it was okay to open any file, and when the request was coming from an untrusted source, and that meant that uh, uh, it couldn't provide the kind of security guarantees that a programmer who knows the context could. And that was the conclusion of the talk. Mm -hmm. Well, it, you know, I, I've had a chance over the years to look at uh, large pieces of uh, uh, code in places like the internet. And um, I'm not so sure that we are not running uh, code that's uh, more of the um, uh, demonstration and educational use uh, in production uh, than we uh, perhaps ought to be even today. Um, a lot of a lot of early code exists and is used uh, no matter uh, uh, what the uh, security review might say. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, well. I'm, but yeah. Uh, there was another article um, in the, again in the New York Times about how it's not going to replace people doing the work, but it will do the boring parts of their jobs for them. And uh, treating this as a, an overall benefit, at least in that aspect, not, not putting people out of work, but letting them focus on the hard problems rather than the drudgery. I don't know to what extent people agree with that. Does anyone agree? Because I I, yeah. I would I would have a, be hard put to say what what part of any given job is the boring part. You know, if I if I can yes, say, sorry. Dennis, um, I think uh, I think that that's the way it was described is putting lipstick on the pig. You hear this every time it's an advance in automation. Oh no, we're not putting people out of work. We're just making them more productive. We're only automating the routine or the the bad parts. No, you're you're automating whatever it is that's going to make a higher degree of productivity so you can do more with less. And if that's automating the exciting parts and you're stuck, you know, in, in like the, the workers in an Amazon factory, now they just stick stuff in boxes because that's the only part that can't be automated. Uh, that That's the way that's going to go down. The idea that this isn't going to affect the labor is silly. It's It's going to have dramatic impacts on labor. And I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think this is very common. There's been wave after wave of this kind of stuff. And it's going to transform most jobs, as far as I can see, but it's also going to eliminate a lot of jobs and create a whole bunch of different jobs as well. Yep, I agree with that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Though I think it's going to eliminate an awful lot of jobs. Um, and it's probably going to eliminate jobs in sectors that have been fairly protected in uh, in in uh, uh, in past years. Uh, if you noticed in the uh, the current uh, problem with television and movie writers and uh, the uh, uh, producing agencies, uh, they want to have uh, protection against uh, uh, scripts written by uh, by bots. Yeah. By the way, uh, one of the most amazing things I saw in one of these videos was the the sick the four words from Hemingway and the stories that the that the the, the AI wrote uh, uh, baby shoes never worn and it wrote this very touching story um, that to me blows me away. I'd watch that show. TV. Yeah. So we may get actual better programming from the bots that generate Netflix programs, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, it's not, some of them are pretty bad. I, I watch almost anything with space, and I'm currently watching a very bad one. <laughs> is there a good one? Oh yeah, there've been a few good ones, but uh, but mostly mostly they're dreadful. But I can do the crossword puzzle while I'm watching. Okay, which one is that? I don't know. Right, I have to think right now. Which which one? Uh, um, Oh, uh, Sisyphus, I just started. Um, it sounds interesting, but it's got these crazy plot holes in episode one. <laughs> for, for what it's worth, you know, there's there's an Israeli show, which is very directly relevant to the conversation here, that just came out called Mrs. Davis. So yes. The name itself is supposed to be kind of off-putting or... It's, it's, it could be, have been so much better. It is... Driving me crazy that it is as in, is inane as it is. I mean, they're not really addressing, they're showing the problems of this overarching AI without ever exploring the social effects of it. And the, 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 the storyline is pretty much orthogonal to the AI. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's irritating me. I've done five episodes in, but... Well, it's because it wasn't written by an AI who knows about what it's like to be. That's there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I actually been um, previously trying to use ChatGPT to actually study the ChatGPT, so including its social effects and asking about if it can offer me material is pretty good. It does offer material how to provide the safety regulation, so at least it pointed correctly to the literature that can, uh, for example, uh, tell more about ethical concepts and how to use those in practice. So it was quite interesting. And there is general, um, I don't remember who actually wrote it exactly, um, but I think it was also in a book of uh, Kockelberg who wrote a book on AI ethics is that you can use the tools uh, against the system mm -hmm. who made those tools. <laughs> in order to fight them but it also requires certain structure so that for example like a uh, regulations that um, you can use these tools to fight back so i think this may be also used because this is jet is also made like an assistant so that's one of the biggest risks i think uh, to the job that it may pose it's the job of assistant yeah uh, because it does do a good job in that in some sense. So of course it depends on the type of assistance uh, people require. So I think I, it is quite interesting to use it when studying itself. So it won't reveal information, uh, how it was made, like, and et cetera. So more not public, but it does help to find information, how to actually work on these issues. <laughs> I just saw an example where they asked it and it cited four books to explain how it works. And none of those books actually exist. I saw I saw a cited version where that was a paper instead, and they cited three, four different things, and two of the papers didn't exist, so the uh, the AI wrote them. Wrote them. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. It's um for me it was so that some links didn't work, but uh, when it comes to the official sources like IEE Institute and uh, others, so like 
from European Commission, those files existed, just the links that it provided. I don't know why, but those doesn't just work. So you have to research it in piece of information, for example, it mm -hmm. provides you. Right. But generally, the like, concepts, it's named correctly, at least from the academic literature. Yeah, I was wondering, this is, these things are trained on everything that's on the internet. I, I was wondering what would happen if we trained it on more or less vetted sources, published books, um, newspapers, and uh, that, that actually publish errata when they make a mistake, uh, scientific journals, and left out uh, things from unvetted sources like Twitter and uh, Facebook posts and whatnot. And I wondered if that would make uh, a difference. In at least in terms of the hallucination problem. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so uh, this is sort of like uh, saying you don't want to uh, you don't want to teach history in the public schools because it's uh, sometimes disturbing. No, it means I don't want to learn history in the public schools from all my neighbors. I want to learn it from historians. Okay. Of all stripes. Mm -hmm. But I want, vetted, I want vetted sources. I want people who, um, if they make a mistake, correct, are willing to admit it and will correct it. Uh -huh. We don't get that in, in real life. No, but we do get it in, in uh, newspapers, they always have corrections. We get it in textbooks with errata sections. We get, we get it in reviewed journals. We get it in reviewed journals, even though yeah. it's up here, there is an effort to be correct. Whereas on the general internet, there's often in an incentive not to be. And so I'm just wondering if what would happen if we built something that was trained on vetted sources. Well, we could have I, I think you're right. The, the issue here is is uh, curation. Right. And I think that what's going to happen is it's expensive to curate stuff. And people are going to develop curated databases and they're going to, you know, give you access to it, but it's going to cost money, uh, the quality of the stuff that you get. It's like the whole reason we had Bloomberg terminals, as you probably know, <laughs> was they had access to all of the accurate financial information that other people uh, you know, we're just, you know, my, my cousin says I should buy IBM, you know, it was not the level of uh, curation that, that they wanted. So right now, this is just, you know, they just threw everything in there. It's a kitchen sink. But I think that uh, my guess is a whole ecosystem of uh, people to mine and curate data to stick into these systems is going to be uh, very important for the same reason that, you know, I read the New York Times and I don't read, I don't know, Daily Beast or something. Maybe that's a bad example. But but my question, but then the question is, is there enough content to to reach the you know the level you need to make it useful? I don't know. It's a good question. So it's a difficult question, Alan. I don't see how you uh, you can do that except experimentally. Uh, yeah, and it's as he said, it's expensive. But you know, Copilot costs like ten bucks a month now. And, um, I, I'm sure that somebody who spends the money to curate could find a business model to recover that. Yeah. the The other question is, uh, you know, the predictors all seem to be um, seem to be sort of next in symbol. Mm -hmm. And maybe you should be predicting two symbols or four symbols or three symbols or something ahead. And that would give a slightly larger range of, uh, of possibilities and might converge more quickly. Or it might take lots longer to converge or never converge at all. Yeah, that's that's the concern because it's a, a wide branching tree, right? Yeah. I don't know. I think I'm going to have to write one, <laughs> but then I, then I have to find a way to get my my data in. That's the that's of course the the critical thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is going to happen here? I mean, 
um, if these if this technology gets applied very broadly across our our society, uh, which is, I'd say, probability one. Um, to what extent are we dependent on the technology? Well, I mean, there are enormous benefits. They, I read that it, it solved all the folding problem of all the proteins in a human body in a matter of a couple of months, where it would take a PhD thesis per protein um, mm. without it, which is which is pretty remarkable. So there are clearly uh, benefits here, but the risks, you know, there, there's. Uh, the, the fake videos and fake pictures, the Pope in the fluffy jacket that fooled a lot of people, um, it's going to make it that you won't be able to trust your lying eyes anymore. Mm -hmm. That's that's a real risk. Or maybe yeah, it, maybe it's a benefit. We'll we'll learn to be more more cautious about what we what we believe from what we read and see because this this fake stuff will be so persistent. Is that right? Well, maybe, or you'll end up with uh, something like we had with the COVID virus, where there was a whole industry created on being anti-COVID virus uh, and anti-vaccine, and uh, companies of substantial size with uh, substantial uh, video production skills were producing uh, documentaries which were sold over. YouTube yeah. or places like that, uh, which were pretty nice fiction. Yeah, I think that um, this concern in terms that it may teach us not to believe. So I think we already experienced uh, something like that. And uh, later it may just get uh, worse in the sense that you cannot believe anything what you see or what you hear, which can be quite problematic because human is actually made on trust. We trust others that they will not attack us. We trust others to actually build something. So this is how society is built. It's built on trust initially. So in some sense, you have to turn your back to others and let them cover it for you so that you can do your thing. Because if we would just constantly try to protect ourselves, we wouldn't actually make it to society at all. We're not talking even the level as it is now. And uh, of course, it is about how to enjoy the good things and uh, try to minimize the bad, the side effects that it has, and which are, can be quite severe. And uh, I think that one way is the certification that I think uh, I previously talked about. So then it would limit the access. So again, since it is powerful technology, it would just um, help uh, to minimize who has access to this in sense that it may be available public, but not to the full capacity, because again, it can be weaponized. Uh, it can be used for many things. And it's also important to actually introduce certain education for general users, how to make decisions with such tools, how to receive information from such tools. Because now we're introducing digital literacy in school, but since the technology pace is quite fast, it's also, I think, important to include AI tools as well. So um, that would be definitely important. At least I think it's highly important to teach kids because we can, or I, okay, we can kind of manage it in some sense. But uh, when it comes to more vulnerable minds, uh, there is some definitely explanation and uh, lessons should be given. So again, certification would also not only establish who can kind of use the technology or who has a right to do, to do that, but also when you receive certificate, it means you pass through a certain training. It means that you know uh, or learned about this technology. And it's also good if it would include uh, the ethical um, and uh, also uh, other type of social consequences that it may bring. So, for example, even uh, those teams uh, of ethics and society that uh, even were uh, in Microsoft. So there was this article that noted that they actually helped to understand how the consequence, because sometimes we just cannot see 
what can happen. It requires explanation, examples, uh, and other types of work to actually give uh, this kind of view because yes, one thing when you study it or when you kind of interacted with this before and you understand this, but the other thing is when you never actually faced this before. So you may have some ideas, but never explored or never get, got the opportunity to do that. So this is also important. And I think the certain shifting power so from certain companies that own the technology, because now there is this big race going on. So who will basically dominate in this area uh, with this technology? So if only one company or two companies in the world control AI, basically, what does it mean also for us? So because again, it's powerful technology, it also studies human. So it may persuade, right? It may influence. Uh, it may do many other things uh, that actually uh, in this uh, human computer interaction that can influence opinion or ideas. So, and it's so subtle, it may not even be so much pointed at, at first or even considered to be as breaking some law or uh, human rights because some of these influences are so subtle that it only later comes. Uh, so clear that what was happening and it may take quite a while which is uh, problematic so yes so, so i think we we do have a model in the handling of biological systems where we have the level one for things that are if they escape the lab it's not terrible and level four we have a pandemic if it does um and i wonder if uh, that's a model that we can use to regulate these systems uh, yes, I think it's very interesting. And before, um, I thought also looking in this direction because generally this type of things are already considered as having big social impact. So yes, again, if Corona gets out, it has not only like impact on health, on social as well. And many of us experienced it before it wasn't so clear. So, but now we know that it, lockdown has effects on mentality, we can't just put our bodies uh, in an apartment or in a house in some space and stay there. Why not? Like logically, why not? Like you could just stay, make some calls to your close one. It also has this subtle influences that influence human, not our logic. We not only logical creatures, so we not consist purely of syntax. And uh, I think it's also getting into the system, this understanding of human nature. And again, like you mentioned this um, level four, level one, I think it's classification is would be important. Also classification in the fields is important, I think, because different AI in different disciplines affect disciplines differently. So one thing when it's like in the medicine, another thing when it's on social media and et cetera. So I think, it's important. And as I will start saying uh, regarding um, CRISPR, right? So we know it may affect human and following generations. So there are strict regulations and safety procedures uh, how actually use it. So there is rigorous testing before it gets out or even used uh, for something. So in that sense, yes, it is a good, like a blueprint, but there is, of course, uh, some adjustments uh, required. Yeah. My, my friend has written a science fiction book, uh, actually a series, and one of the key parts is that CRISPR has es escaped and has become available to terrorists. So, uh, and that, that would be a risk with trying to limit the AI this way too, so. It, it is, would be a big risk because Okay, one thing you affect one generation. Okay, but you follow, uh, you then influence all other generations. So yeah. would you prohibit people then having children, those who are affected? If it's a huge, for example, uh, I don't know, piece of population of certain country or uh, even worldwide, mm -hmm. how then it's approached? Because again, this is prohibited for a reason because one, yes, you may know approximately, or you may be sure that this uh, piece of um, DNA uh, respond for this element, but it may also respond for something else. And then it can be a problem. Yeah. You know, like there was uh, DNA uh, CRISPR implemented for twins uh, for 
I think, HIV protection because one of their parents has HIV so that they would be safe. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know now, but th there is definitely prison time involved. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure uh, how um, long and whether it's actually, how did they later approach the situation, but it was definitely a shock that this technology was used for gene editing because their children of these children will also have this. Right. So it's going to stay there. Yeah. So it's, oh, mm -hmm. sorry. You have more? No, no. I just, uh, like you started talking, I got an idea that, or I wanted to add that um, same can be with AI because this so influences on our nature, human nature can also be passed down. So like people from uh, like our parents, right? They had their ideas in them. So which they pass down, whether we accept them or not, they still influence. Same can be here, like social media. Those people who grew up with it will have certain ideas that will be passed down how maybe the mind, the ideas uh, toward, again, society, they also will be passed down. So it all have influences, maybe not directly biological, but it yeah. does manifest. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to what I was saying about how um, this technology kind of, I don't know, how you were saying it kind of reminded me of like how we're treating like nuclear technology at this time. The know-how of how to make uh, nuclear weapons or how to do um, anything when it comes to that field is heavily guarded and has become something that you can only, you know, study at certain places and they'll only give the information to once you reach a certain clearance or security level. Would you think that would, like, um, carry on for AI? Because if anyone is able to create a large language model and be able to scrape the internet for data um, and create these models that are capable of, um, I don't know, doing whatever we want, there is no way to kind of limit or have certifications or have some sort of uh i don't know blocks in order to uh, in our words protect society from its effects they can be deployed anywhere because we're so uh interconnected um with the internet so how would how would that work would you think there would be a kind of like restriction on the studying of uh large language models and generative ai or do you think that's not necessary in order to keep um in order to keep in order to introduce uh certifications and introduce limits on how it's allowed to be used when it's allowed to be used and what kind of models can be made i don't think it's possible to control studying it that's for sure but i'll let answer the rest of the questions <laughs> I hope somebody can also talk because I think I talk too much on this. <laughs> no, 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 no. no, you're very, you're very, you're very clear about the, uh, your, your what you say, it, and uh, we appreciate it enormously. Zoe. And you're the only professional on the topic here too. So. I'm not professional, just to read a lot and start to <laughs> work with this. <laughs> but maybe I'm getting there. Okay, so like also. This point was in a video of Raskin and Harris from Center for Human Technology that uh, uh, Dennis shared. So there was this uh, very interesting idea uh, that nukes cannot make stronger nukes, but AI can make stronger AI. Mm -hmm. So it can actually enhance, enhance itself. Plus, um, nukes are dependent on a certain material that certain countries can get. AI doesn't. So you can make it, uh, you don't, you need just uh, enough computing power and um, like purchase all the things and also depends on the, how strong you want to make it, uh, how you want to train it. So to what extent uh, it will be unsupervised because uh, on that also depends computation. And uh, so it could be used in that sense, but it's still different case. That's what's important to understand because there is still there is some limits by countries, but here there are no limits. It's like a worldwide. So you can't like there is certain ways to of course regulate it. There are ideas and there is an action becoming clearer, but it just still uh there it is good idea to look into this field as well, to learn from it, yet it still requires understanding that it's something else. So we have not really faced this type of ubiquitous technology before, I think. Hmm. 
so then it would be possible or would not be possible to kind of limit and certify certain people to make certain language models and certify certain language models as being safe if anyone and everyone can just constantly make it wouldn't it be would it make any sense to even do that because then at that point if you certify i don't know spend a lot of time creating and certifying a language model and i know 10 other people just create 10 language models without these certifications without any of the safeguards and then just deploy them and allow people to use them what is there to say that someone won't use the kind of uncertified model is what what was the point of even making the certified one versus the uncertified one mm -hmm. this is a very good question uh, and in this sense i suggest to look into automobile industry or airplane industry so you can fly on an airplane without certification <laughs> But it's unlikely it's public airline or something, but you can, of course. So certification is not only tied to a certain country. There are universal certifications that any country can receive that would show the quality standard. So when you use a language model that is certified, that has standard that was verified and tested, it gives also trust from people. Because later, I think, when people learn more about this, they will also consider, okay, this uh, technology is this language model. I hope this will be maybe, or not, I, I don't know even what to think about, but it should be also clear. And since there are more brands, so to say, of it, there will be also choices. And so uh, when it's certified, people have more trust into it, right? Or same into automobile industry, you have certification. You also have health certification that requires uh, actually for the car being produced there is also how to handle customer certifications so certification will never hurt that's for sure i think because um it provides a more clearer understanding of the technology to the person who uh, provides it who develops it and etc and hopefully to the users who also may take some lessons or uh, they may not receive a certificate, uh, which is maybe required for development and distribution, but they can take some lessons that hopefully will be introduced in schools and universities. So in that sense, certification, it's just, uh, it's already happening because it is a technology. It should be certified. There should be a standard. Uh, can I comment on, 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 I don't think we can, uh, it's a fool's errand to try to control who develops this or what you're allowed to develop or what kind of data you can get. What we need to do is regulate use. And uh, you have to meet certain standards in order to use it for certain purposes. We do this all over the place and, you know, I can read all I want and learn all I want about the law, but to practice law, I have to be certified uh, in order to engage in that behavior. So I, I think this is, uh, the same thing's gonna happen here. We have the same thing in, in adverti political advertising on television. You know, you if you put out an ad, the the person on whose behalf the ad is being put has to say, I'm so-and-so and I approve this ad. Well, that's the kind of thing we're going to need in, in a wide variety of different areas. Um, you know, we probably in education, just to pick something, uh, before you're allowed to use this technology uh, unsupervised un, uh, with respect to, say, you know, eighth graders, uh, it has to... Uh, be vetted and meet certain standards, and you'll have committees that can approve that. Um, so that, that's the way I think this, this whole thing has to be rolled out. So the question, the important question is, can we identify in advance what those dangers are and lay down those guide rails in advance? Or do we need to wait and see what happens and then try to roll it back? You know, you're not allowed to use this thing to talk to children. You're not allowed to use it or uh, you know, persuading people under certain conditions or whatever it might be, or for political discourse. Uh, that's the kind of restrictions that I think will come out in regulatory frameworks over the next decade or so. I just, uh, just sort of ran into a, an interesting example that um, the AI is making biometrics less secure. Uh, they can record your voice for as little yes. as five seconds and then completely re reproduce your speech patterns. Um, Visual, you know, like face ID, uh, presumably could be fooled as these things get better. Uh, so it's going to have an impact on biometrics, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, but but you know, there, there are two there are two levels here. We've got the level where the product is the AI itself, and then it's the product is the creation of an AI. 
And uh, are we going to give AIs uh, agency or not? Are they going to be able to sign contracts and and create things which it then is, is then sold in the marketplace as belonging to the AI? Or do you have the issue of the AI always being a slave to a human? Well, well Dennis, you, go ahead. Um, you know, the, 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 there's major issues in terms of copyright and patent protection that hit directly on the kind of issues that you're talking about. You know, can can it be uh, protected? Can it, can the output of these things be uh, copyrighted? Uh, you know, if it comes up with an invention, who owns that? These are all issues that have to be worked out in the law. But, you know, to me, the whole thing revolves around the legal theory of product liability. You put a product out there and you say it's good for this, and it turns out it's not good for that, or it's dangerous for that, or it has some side effect, you've got liability. And I think that in contrast to what happened with social media with the, you know, Section 230 of the uh, digital, whatever, Digital Communications Act, um, you know, we, we need to have uh, uh, be a lot more restrictive about what kind of liability goes along with the release of these particular systems. No, yeah, that's probably true. But I'm not really certain that uh, all of AI's uh, output is going to be generated uh under human control uh they have hallucinations in some sense they have uh, uh a, they could could easily have some sort of self-generated i must tell a story uh and continue to tell stories uh built into the their their internal structure which we didn't put there they learned that and so it's, it's it's not clear at all to me that we haven't created uh, another source of substantial intelligence on the planet. Uh, maybe not really clear intelligence and maybe not all that smart, but it looks to me like it has the same sort of rights. When you can't tell the difference between the output of an AI and the output of a human being, it becomes kind of hard to give one rights and the other not. Well, but there may be requirements to label. That, that That's another approach that this can be. But again, coming back to the law, Dennis, there's, uh, there's this concept in the law about uh, what kind of control you have over your animals. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is called first bite theory. And uh, really, the, the, I'm not making this up. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what happens is you have a response. The question is, are you responsible if your dog bites somebody? And the answer is, if you took reasonable precautions and, you, and there was no reason to believe that that was going to happen, the first time out, you don't have uh, a criminal liability for that. If you've been on, if you've been on notice, and that's pretty well defined in the law, um, then uh, then you are liable. And there are people who've gone to jail with the dogs biting other people because they had already good evidence that that might happen and could cause those kinds of problems. So we're going to have to have some kind of first bite theory for uh, these AIs uh, because we just don't know what they're going to do. And they are kind of like dogs and we just don't have the, the leashes yet. And we need to figure out how to get leashes and put them on these systems so that there's some measure of control, uh, at least within some kind of uh, radius or boundary. Yeah, so I wanted to, you know, I like the idea of the first bite theory. So are you suggesting, you know, some company, Facebook, OpenAI, releases a, a large language model people discover as they already have that it can do research level chemistry and can tell you how to build um you know great synthesized nerve agents from ingredients you buy at home depot and so somebody does this and so the first time this happens like facebook isn't liable uh but the second time they are and the question is can they even recall it once the cat is out of the bag yeah i that, I, I worry about that yes uh so there is a couple of things I want to mention. So there was a question regarding uh, the status of AI, so moral and uh, as an agent. So for now, it is considered that it doesn't, it does not have the capability to actually be considered uh, as an agent uh, or as a having personhood. So it's just good to leave space for that to rethink. But currently, it is more like a tool. Yet there have been propositions for uh, it, uh, giving it the status of electronic persons. 
So it was a proposition, um, and like it was different controversial resolution of 2017 in the European Parliament. So that's, um, which suggested that given the more sophisticated autonomous robot, the status of electronic persons, which would be like one possible legal solution to the issue of legal responsibility. But it was not taken by European Commission into 2018 uh, strategy. But there is this an idea that occasionally, depending on the context, it may uh, get this electronic personhood, so situational um, agency, uh, because it's already doing things on its own. Of course, we should also think how much we want to rely on it, because it all can be hacked, it all can go wrong. So uh, there is this question as well. And another point was about non-humans. So definitely there has been a um, certain uh, crossing in that sense. So how do we treat non-humans and then AI, which is another type of non-human. So living non-humans and non-living non-humans. So what the, how do we distinguish them? Do we value them differently? So does AI actually equals the dog or is dog more valuable or maybe AI more valuable? So I think at the moment, probably the dog is more valuable as a being, but uh, we will see how this uh, goes on. So <laughs> the first byte theory is actually, um, it, it's, it's a good example and it, it exists in some sense. So some skeptics, they also consider that there may not be time for regulations now. So it may be too early because AI is still nascent, right? So uh, it would be better to create rules once AI applications appear on the market and violate existing laws. But the problem is that the violations that may occur may be quite severe and having certain chain of consequences. So at least I think it's important to wrap some head around it or at least try to. So even some uh, regulations on privacy, it already can help to set the limits. How uh, do we proceed with this? So yes, I think it's all for now. So yeah, so how do we approach it? Do we need actually to wait something to happen? For example, like we discussed, uh, there being security and uh, other type of regulations or just system rethought after 9-11, right? So the cockpit door was strengthened, the how security have, do we need something like this to happen in technological world to actually start rethinking the system? because it was like a terrible situation. It was a terrible thing. And uh, do, we, do we need things like that? To, of course, we can think as a philosophy of life, you know, we need to have certain grotesque things happening to this uh, experience of life. But certain things, do, do we really need to wait for them? Well, because there, there are ways to still approach this. We can do this, yeah. Well, we, we waited with social media and we found out it had terrible effects that now we're having a terrible time undoing. So yeah. I don't know if that, that holds. Yes, of course. So attention span in kids, for example, many having dyslexia now because of this, again, competition for your attention. And now there is different type of competition going on that also influences us. And even for example, such thing as coronavirus, it's not a technology, but still the system of healthcare started being rethought deeply to its roots after such thing happened as a pandemic. When yeah. everybody got locked up at homes for two years, basically, when everybody had to shift to the digital, uh, because there were not enough places or certain system safety things, um, uh, concepts in place that would help like washing hands more frequently or wearing masks in public. So like, now we know we have the experience, of course, it helps, but we, all of us going through, many people also died in this process. So is this also something we're looking for? Yeah. Uh, to, to point on, on the legal, if somebody just published a graphic novel uh, using a, a generative AI to do the, the graphics, and a judge just ruled that she could copyright the text, but not the pictures. So... Yes, I saw that. I, I actually think that was a bad decision and it was a mistake because the, really the question is, what's the human content? That's right. you know, up till now, it's either been 100% or zero. 
and now we have something in the middle. And uh, again, it comes down to curating all of those. Uh, I, ha I, have an I have an example about that. Many years ago, I was looking through a book, Man and Machine, and this was commissioned by IBM when people were worried about the electronic brain and they wanted to humanize it. And they brought in Steiglitz to go into IBM and photograph the company's place. And one picture was of one of was my mentor when I was a postdoc at IBM. And the picture captured his essence. And I called him right away and I, I said, what was that all about? He says, oh, this guy came in, he shot like a thousand shots, right? And he picked that one. And it's the curation that's the copyrightable aspect, not the drawing itself. It's picking the, the right one that the generative AI created. Um, I had another question about um, the AI and said something interesting, because my understanding is that there is no reason for an AI to do anything unless someone with a motivation asks it to do it. Um, and therefore, um, when the AI does something bad, we have someone to hold responsible. And it's not the AI that did the bad thing. It was the person who provided the trigger. And no, I don't think that's true. Well, um, why, why this is, a, this is a, uh, from a Steven Pinker book from 20 or 30 years ago. But why would why would a, his question was why would a robot choose to do anything? Uh, why do we choose to do things? He believes that uh, we choose to do things because of emotion was his answer. Um, a uh, generated AI doesn't have emotion, so why would it do anything without a prompt? No, I don't believe that you can state that a generative AI doesn't have emotions. Uh, it uh, it may take. Uh, some new organs inside of the AI unit to deal with emotions. Uh, but then there are lots of things that require augmentation to be able to handle things that signals that are not present in uh, in the sequentiality of uh, symbols. Yeah, sir, sir, I'm sitting here looking at the chat GPT screen and uh, it answered my last question, but it hasn't followed up in any way on its own. Um, is that a, just part of the UI, or is that an inherent nature of the system? Good question. It's a research paper that you should write. <laughs> I don't know if I'm competent to answer it. Well, you can see Disney's the Sorcerer's Apprentice to see what can happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but my point was that that if sure, if the AI is acting in response to a human input then in a sense, that human is, is responsible for the output, and, and the AI is not. Well, that's I think the courts have been saying that. Alan, the question is, is it, reasonable, is it a reasonable expectation that you could have predicted that outcome? I think that comes back yes. to this question of legal liability. That's right, yes. And so so it's, it, it's going to be a gray area, and we're going to have an awful lot of lawyers that are going to be employed figuring all of that kind of stuff out. But on, on back on, I think, on the issue that you made, um, music, when it was first recorded, the Supreme Court decided that it could not be copyrighted. Uh, and it, that a big uproar happened, and then that changed. Uh, I believe the same thing happened with photographs, that uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't copyright a photograph. But then uh, I think the example you gave of the curation of the photographs changed the view that photography, and then photography, of course, became an important art form, not just simply something where you press a button and record something. So I, we're going to go through the same process, I think, over the next couple of decades as this as this uh, works out. Well, I think that, you know, what copyright protects against, uh, it does not include ideas, methods, et cetera, et cetera, right. et cetera. That's a patent, and it has a whole different set of standards and rules. Uh, it protects against somebody making a photocopy that is an identical copy or nearly identical copy that looks like the original copy and then having a stack of those books and their booksellers stand across the street from the one in that the publishers of the actual first copies were. And that's a sort of 15th century publishing uh, uh, mechanism. It basically says, that copyright 
protects the uh, sense, the sensibility the expression. of the yeah, expression. The expression, yeah. the actual expression. But but Dennis, there there are limitations to that that have been nuances that have been worked out over the years. You've got fair use. Uh, you know, I can go ahead and quote you uh, up to a certain point, and I'm not sure what the rules exactly are on that. There is no rule. It's what's ever decided in court. That one okay. I know about. Okay, so there's this uh, fair use. There's also um, there was something else on that. Uh, seen a fair. Oh, parody. Parody. You can do parody. Uh, that's not considered uh, copying. Uh, mm -hmm. So, again, it's a judgment that has to be made, but, but these are considered, uh, at least conceptually, exceptions to those rules. Yeah. Um, okay, I think to the point that I was holding the hand, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, there was a question about human responsibility. So, of course, uh, this is a separate question in this, partially, because, again, AI system is so complicated, it consists of so many elements. So, there is creation, there is training, there is data, there is distribution, and etc. And it's only just a few that involves different teams of people. So, different responsibilities, different uh, actors. Mm -hmm. And it all implies that some make input. So, there is already issue of responsibility. And when it comes into the hands of someone who also do some certain misconduct, there is another question like how this person is responsible versus technology. So of course, currently the human is responsible because we have moral agency. Machine does not have moral agency. So we should be carrying the responsibility or we are, <laughs> we, we just do. So it is the way uh, it is. But uh, the, Another thing, when we have question about weaponization of artificial intelligence, it's about like given you, you give certain weapon like a gun to the person who don't know how to use it or um, kind of imply misconduct. So then it will be probably a question of distribution who gave this person this technology because uh, the conduct was uh, 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 to be the have a negative consequences, right? So then this allocation of responsibility in general thinking, how do we approach this in this case? So I think when it comes just uh, user versus technology, so misconduct of a user, then it comes to the case, what happened, because we cannot, there is no universal model how to judge people. If there would be, there would be no court. There will be no judges or any legal system in place. So we have to look what happened. Same with a car crash. When car crashes and there is a driver, who is responsible? Again, we have to look. Is it car malfunction? Is it driver wasn't aware? Maybe the driver was sick. Something happened, like, I don't know, some kind of fainted during the driving, so health issues, or maybe drunk. Or maybe just the situation on the road was complicated, and now tornado, or some natural issues, disasters, or okay, tornado maybe too much, but it was maybe a heavy rain, which also affects the interaction with the road, the friction. So we have to look what's happening. There is no like who is responsible, like one answer for all. So definitely the personalized cases. So maybe there is special. Uh, certain jurisdiction will be, or a group of um, persons who analyze this. If we talk about legal systems, so rights or law on AI, so a certain part of it, or generally maybe some wide accepted rules, because even in juridical system, there are certain gradings, what you can get for certain misconduct. And generally, since it is a technology, I think it will be going to ICT, section. So if you misuse social media for also certain uh, malicious ends, it will be in that direction, I guess. So you think, I think that's really practical, though. Um, uh -huh. Most most of these uh, uh, regulations for behavior, um, you say, uh, don't use naughty words on the internet or uh even you have to punctuate with commas and that sort of thing uh, the rules but we tend to ignore them mm -hmm. people people use uh, inappropriate words on the internet all the time they talk about things they shouldn't we have um 
pictures and stories which are um, not not polite, mm -hmm. not acceptable in mixed company, that sort of thing. And we 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 still muddle along. And there there can be the argument that if you don't have these bad things in the in the space of possibility, then the good things are not really identifiable either. Well, Everything is always good. It's not very interesting. Uh, I agree with this disposition. If you don't know the good, you can't know the bad, and the mm -hmm. other way. But here, uh, it's more about like consequence. So how the severe consequences. So, so if somebody says a couple bad words on the internet or shares an uh, unpleasant story, I think uh, it won't go. Uh, quite long way but when we talk about serious like uh, terrorism right so when weaponization of AI when we talk about many people actually experience the consequences when it influences people like manipulating political campaigns for example that's mm -hmm. that's what I'm talking about in terms of uh, legal regulation but this is a daily thing so somebody can get accused for this offense in the internet right so somebody I don't know, had bad conversation with someone else and et cetera, somebody not. It it depends the way it goes, I think. So if this proceed or not, what are the consequences in this? Even if you file a suit, it doesn't always mean that you're gonna win or even it will get reviewed and yeah. you can proceed further to the court. So, so do you think we could train an AI to be moral or ethical rather? This is a good question, but it's a little different. It's a little different. It's um, going further. So uh, we're then closing the chapter on, on, on law and going to morality of AI. <laughs> because this is a big question because, first of all, can we actually explain our morality? Can we, can we tell how to be moral? We don't good know question. how to be Can because, you? Huh? Can you? Uh, I can try. But I'm not sure I will succeed <laughs> because uh, the point is that uh, we act in life. We don't think, okay, I'm going to do this because there is this uh, scripture on morality. I'm acting like I see grandmother. Uh, I want to help her with products carrying, for example, to the fourth floor if we're talking about apartment. And then like I have to do this because Aristotle said it's good because uh, there is other ancient Greek said it's good and my mother said it's good. We just act out. Not always mm -hmm. think this is the problem with uh, computational ethics that, or morality as well. So that you cannot really always explain what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, it's important. It's, it's very important when it comes to uh, structural decisions like application to the job, right? So employment, banking, you have to explain. But in daily life, we just act. So it's not, yes, there is some thought maybe, like my mother would think it's good to help grandmother, so I'm going to do this. But generally, it's not, it doesn't have this um, kind of strict sense written. So how, if we compute it, it still will not act like us. I mean, it cannot act like us, but it will not still get closer. Yet, it doesn't mean we should give up. <laughs> mm -hmm. There are approaches how to do this. So. Legal boundaries, because legal certain legal um, concepts they are also grounded in ethics and morality, right? Mm -hmm. And they are restated. It may be not. It may be clear, like don't kill, right? We we know this. It's bad, taking human's life, but it's still in the law, because it happens. So such things stay restated, even though it's kind of common sense, and that we can teach through law because law is more defined. It's also easier to explain because it's, in a sense, more logically formed. And there can be moral preferences. For example, there was an idea for self-driving cars to encode a certain sense of morality of their um, driver. So what the distance they want to stand like. So, of course, in, term, in legal uh, boundaries, but you can choose a little further or a little less. So, you know, some people are gonna stand very close <laughs> right to your back and some kind of further. So what type of person are you in that sense? And this kind of subtle um, things could also give the character to the these machines, 
So like self-driving cars, it still have human oversight, at least it should. And uh, yes. So, so you want you want an AI which has a conscience, a little this thing that sits on your shoulder and says whispers in your ear, "Oh, don't do that. That's a good idea. Not a good idea." Uh, this is uh, here we are talking about um, negative ethics and positive ethics. So, or just negative ethics for now. So negative ethics is like don't do this. This is prohibited because this is bad based on here is a list, but. Uh, well, I started talking about positive because it's a vision of mm -hmm. how you want to live, how you want to be. So vision of life. So it was also in that video that uh, we should think more about uh, the type of life we want to reach with this technology or in general. This is positive ethics. So how this technology aligns with a vision of our future society and what good does it do? Okay, on morality, then on consciousness. <laughs> Because it's it's a different thing, so it's still considered to be far. Because to cause a mind, you need the power so equal or even higher to the brain. Because again, we are not just pure syntax. So um, if we would be syntax, then computer is about the same. So just running a program is not enough to create a mind. You can have uh, imitation or uh, this yeah imitation of mind. So like we have this chat GPT, it behaves human like. Some may even uh, fall in love with them maybe because they present this feature. So it's anthropomorphism, I think, mm -hmm. so that it presents these features and we perceive it as human. So like this Turing test idea is is not really working because imitation of consciousness doesn't mean there is consciousness. Yeah, that's true. It should be clear for everyone because some people uh, think that it does have consciousness or emotions. It is just a program running. So I don't know what it would take because it's it's something that's been studied already for many years and it's generally a mystery of humankind. So there have been this, again, from ancient times, there have been this sculptures coming alive. I mean, in the Smiths, then golems, then Frankenstein. So recreation of life, what it takes to recreate the life. Of course, there is point of technology, like in Frankenstein. So uh, electricity got invented. So like maybe mm -hmm. electricity can give a life. Mm -hmm. No, it didn't. Okay, now we have artificial intelligence. Maybe this can give a life. Maybe it's not. So because generally the name artificial intelligence, it can be... Um, a little tricky so it was meant as a study of a mind through the practical implementation of technology so you try to build a mind or some structures and you learn more so there are two directions and we went more into the direction of making useful smart technologies but there is another one study of consciousness mm -hmm. so that's on on this <laughs> I, see. Well, I have a colleague, I have a colleague who's, I've talked about this for many, many times, and he, he is of the opinion that what we need today to make this work is a, uh, a new religion and a set of ethics to fit that religion, you know, something like Catholicism at the, uh, uh, at the point where the church is split and uh, moved to Constantinople where there is then a, a strict code of conduct and appropriate, well, there's some interesting theories about how strict strict should be. Uh, the, uh, there's an interesting paper on uh, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, game theory, which indicates that you probably want uh, a very strictly enforced set of rules, which has leaks in it that you can adjust from time to time to uh, to handle the cases that don't get handled well. But it's it, it's an interesting thought that we, we what we need is a, a new moral structure, and that moral structure has to be par should be parallel to and tied to how the AIs work, and that the AI's model should be quite good. Now, there are people who say that uh, that's the that's the prescription for disaster. That was how 
um, the uh, uh, the folks who wanted to improve efficiency by eliminating humans and have the AIs do all the all of everything uh, was uh, probably uh, constructed. Um, I don't think that's likely to happen, but I suppose that we should should worry about it. Yeah, that's a good point. I will maybe start with this enforced morality poll. So not all people are moral, or at least in our ideas, also morality can differ because morality is pointed part of it that is a little personal, can be cultural. Mm -hmm. But there are still wide accepted things. Same can be with AI and even coming back to the point of certification. There are widely accepted certificates, but of course people act without them. People buy guns without license. People make uh, DNA sequencing or in their own labs, or even we before discussed the CRISPR, some do things on their own. They don't need license. They don't need anything. They just need the thing to do. So the materials, the technology, and that's it. So there is always will be some outliers and there is nothing really you can do about this because you can't surveil or you shouldn't even surveil everyone. Just make sure that there is a certain standard Something is not accepted. So the whole public doesn't do this. So people are aware of the consequences. It was explained to them and they understand or at least try to, or at least uh, get some idea because sort it depends on the, the how deep the technology is. And then for AI for efficiency, like replacing humans with AI, I also saw something like that. And actually AI can be, or generally algorithmic systems can be useful to improve uh, efficiency and reduce bias, also human bias, because yes, they use more logical data in some sense, like there is a chain, uh, especially when we talk about something like decision trees. Mm -hmm. Yet it still requires human oversight because it's not always correct. And I think this is part of the certificate that I talk about is that to actually teach people how to make decisions with these tools. Make a training that it's not smarter than you, like you need to still look into this, like what is going on? You can't just agree with everything it does. So it would be certificate I'm, like that states like, I know how to make decisions with AI tools. I don't trust it a hundred percent. I'm not allocating responsibility on it. Just for the sake, so I, nobody have questions to me because tool decided that. So because this is a problem that people just think that, oh, it's making decision. I'm just here accepted them. <laughs> <laughs> like I like I already lost my job. <laughs> I already give up. I'm just clicking yes because it's easier. We're wired for making life easier. Our body's wired for making life easier and minds. We don't want to do complicated job if there is an easier way. But this is why it's important to actually understand it's not as easy job. You're not there to click yes to the algorithm. Still, oversight is required. Well, the other thing is if you if you if you click yes as a as a regular feature, the algorithm, the AI will observe the fact that's what you do and eliminate that from the tasks that you have to do because you always click yes. Well, just your boss will eliminate, for example, because like what 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 you're doing there? You just click yes, like, but it's it loses this idea because it gets lost in a process. Yeah. In the process of clicking yes, they're forgetting, like, wait, why do we did it in the first place? Why this person was there? Why it was asking us on whether we agree or not. So this part of the certification and training that would help. Because these systems are not just developed and kept. They're given to public, they're given to services. There are many AI powered ser services. And those people, they're not developers or they're not in a company. That company may have some ethical guidelines like Microsoft, Google, they have some. But when it's shared to third parties, they're not really. So it should come with a certain training also if you want to use it. At least I'm very convinced it should. <laughs> it's like, Given a car, you can buy a car, but you can't drive it. You have to have a license to do that. You, know, you need to know how to behave on the road with other drivers 
how to like keep yourself position what to do in certain situations different things happen mm -hmm. that's what comes with a license and car or motorcycle or any kind of driving transportation airplane airplane is much stricter so i think in that sense it's a little closer to ai because it's more powerful than car car is more like every day so there can be ai airplanes ai cars in the sense that this leveling how how profound how dangerous the technology not everyone can drive an airplane or like flight an airplane in the sense of controlling it which requires a whole school going through so mm -hmm. because you give this technology so teach how to use it i think that's the basics that should be and i don't really see it's coming here <laughs> unfortunately well, you don't see you don't see that there's any alternative to doing something like that and utilizing the technology because if we, if we if we choose not to have regulations what's going to happen it's very hard to tell i think regulations is one of the ways it's already coming so it's already good <laughs> because there are some developments in that area so this is definitely a benefit <clears throat> mm -hmm. but, uh, because we already learned that free market doesn't work so well. You can't say, please don't do this. They're like, okay, we won't. <laughs> so this is the yeah. issue that we have having right now. We're like, please don't make this very dangerous. Please don't surveil us. Don't take our data. Uh, we feel very bad. It's very dangerous to like, no response continue because competition gains and etc so one way to actually intervene is because government has power mm -hmm. this just need to help so <clears throat> players from the field academics we should all come together users also express their concerns what they're afraid of and have this conversation interdisciplinary conversation that actually will help to understand all sides and make the type of regulation, not just in prohibited this, and then people from the technological sector, they don't know what to do because they have no idea how practical is this, how to implement it. So this is why collaboration is important. It's not like government do their thing. It's you don't you don't probably get all of the US newspapers and read them like we do here. But um the uh the number of people who uh have decided how AIs work and how they uh, uh, how they're going to impact things is really quite large. Uh, virtually every commentator has written a column or two about it, and it's quite interesting what they they believe AI can do and will do. Um, it's both uh, uh, much more constrained than it it is in reality, and also much more much broader. Uh, they they work out their fantasies in in terms of talking about what the AIs can and can't do. Mm -hmm. Whereas what we have to do is as, as as technologists is choose the right the right thing to do and uh, to present that in a way that's uh, uh, ethical and moral in some fashion without enforcing it. Mm -hmm. um it's it's an interesting and sort of awesome task which um probably the only way to do it is to convince the ai systems that uh, they should help yeah yeah in the long run you can try <laughs> yeah the, sure. the 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 other thing that's interesting is that there's all this concern about the AI being a, a gatherer of uh, of information, building a uh, a collection of all the world's information in some fashion. And at least as I understand the process, that doesn't seem to be what what they're what what they're doing. What the AI information gathering thing is the training is to try to determine the the symbols that exist in the language of the system being observed 
and their relative frequencies and their uh, transition probabilities. And the knowledge itself is pretty much tossed away. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's very interesting how, how simplistic uh, the underlying ideas really are. Yeah, uh, it's true. So this is the generally question with uh, algorithms and models, because models are just simplification of life. It does not represent life. And mm -hmm. some people believe in AI that it's actually like, I don't know, that it will, uh, this AGI concept, so strong intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, and generally that's this kind of ideas on its, uh, I don't know, human-like intelligence is that they think human intelligence is just a syntax, so simplified, So, but it doesn't take all the complexity. Because another thing that exists in not even academia, but that the simplest answer is like the most correct, so it's the right one. But no, it, Occam's razor. Huh? It's called yeah, Occam's yeah. razor. I, I just forgot how it's called. So, like, is it really so? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I doubt it, to be honest. So, yeah. because I, I don't think the simplest answer is always the best. So, simplest answers, they may be more appealing. That's for sure. But because it's hard to get into complexity and wrap your hands or head around it, depending on different issues, not only AI. So mm -hmm. indeed, so reduce knowledge to symbols and language, reducing human consciousness and intelligence to syntax, just some program in our head running. I don't know. I think it doesn't take, this is where the issues come from generally. So this is the human element in all this that reflected in technology that we should think as a part of uh, ethics. Mm -hmm. Well, there are people who argue that uh... Uh, building a uh, uh, a artificial intelligence generative generative artificial intelligence agent mm -hmm. uh, could be done where it had emotions and it responded emotionally as well as uh, intellectually, or the next symbol could change the mood of the statement and so that sort of thing. So it increases the, the the fan out of of options and makes the decision making process much more difficult, but it also makes it much richer. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a a guy at at Stanford who's been working on that sort of change. He has a, it's different. It's different. It's a different, slightly different approach than the neural net, but it's a it's sort of a hypergeometric net. And uh, it's it's always appealed to me. And uh, there are people who are working on uh, building hardware for it. And it would be a possible possibility. And, you know, their their interest has always been to try to create something that's obviously conscious in some fashion. And maybe this this round of artificial intelligent machines are uh, sort of brain dead at some level. They're certainly not uh, emotionally capable, but they're they could hint what really could be done elsewhere. And the next round of machines will look much or models will look much more interesting and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's what everybody's worried about. Maybe that's what why everybody says, "Well, no more, no more stuff with beyond GPT four until such time as we understand more." Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Anyhow, I'm going to have to go now myself. So thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure to have you. Um, talking and i think uh, i think that uh, uh, i think that your your ideas are well i mean there are several of us here who think you're a, uh, you're a colleague and not a a, a person out on the net so we, we, we're very very pleased to have you around